morning and a very warm welcome to the service of Holy Communion on this third Sunday in the season of the Holy Let us say together our collect for purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts serve men, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, grant the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God is love and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. God our Father, we confess to you and to our fellow members in the body of Christ that we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry. Forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil for the sake of your Son who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. God, who is both power and love, forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by the Holy Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. from the book of Nehemiah. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, and those who could understand, 
and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. But all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Second reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in one body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honourable, we clothe with greater honour. And our less respected members are treated with great respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honour to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it, and if one member is honoured, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. This is the word of the Lord.
When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to a synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am very fond of the old Book of Common Prayer. Although, like most Christians these days, I must say I tend to use a modern language prayer book for my personal morning and evening prayers. But one of the great merits of the old prayer book is the way it leads us straight through the book of Psalms from beginning to end each month, rather than hopping around in the apparently arbitrary fashion of the modern lectionary. And this means that regularly, when the days of the month reach the mid-twenties, as they do this coming week, prayer book users will find themselves spending time with the long Psalm 119 and read many verses praising God for the gift of Holy Scripture, including the well-known verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that, I think, is the true theme of today's readings. The light of God shines in our lives through the words of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, illuminating the way ahead. And there's no time we need this light more than in a time of transition in our lives, sometimes a time of radical change. God's light will show the way ahead for you as a congregation here in Holy Trinity, guiding you in your search for a new rector. And of course, the person appointed will also have sought God's guidance in their process of discernment, knowing that it's time for change and asking God for direction. It's a time of excitement, of hope, of a sense of resolution, and also anticipation as a new ministry gets underway. Our reading from Nehemiah tells us that Ezra too was celebrating God's presence in Scripture when he came back from Babylon, way back in the 6th century BC, and set about reacquainting the people of Jerusalem with the long-forgotten law of Moses. A crowd gathered attentively to hear the book of the law being read aloud, and there were people present who could interpret it as a hopeful message for the here and now. It was so important for that nation, re-established in its homeland after many years of exile, to know 
and understand that God was present with them in that time of rebuilding and spiritual renewal. And some five and a half centuries later, when Jesus came to the synagogue in Nazareth and read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, God shone his light again into the life of the people, wanting to make all things new. Here indeed was a moment of epiphany when God was revealed in Jesus Christ, the word dwelling in the midst of us. God wants everything to be made new for us here and now. It's thrilling to read how Jesus breathed new life into words that would have been very familiar, but had somehow lost their immediacy to inspire and transform. But that day in Nazareth, the congregation was stirred up, for Jesus not only spoke of fulfilling the words of Isaiah, but also reminded people that God was at work in the world far beyond the boundaries of their expectations. The spiritual writer Margaret Silf has a book entitled Beyond Certainty, Living Through Times of Upheaval. The author invites us to imagine a scene somewhere in the countryside, not too difficult, a field which has been under grass for a long time. The field is crisscrossed with footpaths, for many people are used to walking in this field, taking their dogs for their regular walks or taking shortcuts here and there. One day the unimaginable happens. The farmer ploughs up the grassy area into furrows in preparation for next year's harvest. The only creatures who are pleased are the birds, which come flocking to pick up all the food that's been released from the upturned soil. But many are disconcerted because the familiar landscape has changed and they have to find new places to walk. Our spiritual lives can so often feel like this. We walk a familiar pathway and then suddenly it's gone because of bereavement perhaps, or an unexpected job loss, or retirement, or a life-changing medical diagnosis. As our landscape changes, we need the security of our faith to reassure us that God is preparing a new harvest, a harvest of the Spirit which will be plentiful for all and which God wants us to help bring to fruition. In the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus seems to have ploughed up people's settled ways. Theologian Sam Wells has called today's Gospel the Nazareth Manifesto and urges us to have a similar manifesto in our own lives. Sam Wells is the vicar of St Martin in the Fields in London, a church set in the very heart of the needs and challenges of poverty and homelessness. He tells us that the most important word in the Bible is the little word with. Our God is Emmanuel, the God who is with us in Jesus. Back in Nazareth, it wasn't just that the words of Isaiah struck Jesus as a call to immediate action, which wasn't shared by many of his neighbours, but that these words pointed to Jesus himself, here and now, with the people, as the agent of change. This must have been very startling indeed, and many seem to have been upset by Jesus' claims and pretensions. We know from his clashes with the religious establishment that he thought the word of God was preaching those who needed to hear it most, the poor and the outcast, the sick and the lame who sat around the pool at Bethesda or at the gate of the temple and who needed to hear about God's justice and love. The scribes and Pharisees, the professional religious people, were more, in, more interested in applying the letter of the law, heaping up burdens on people's shoulders, telling them exactly in some detail what they should and should not be doing. So many led hopeless lives, burdened by debt, alienated from the synagogue, stigmatized by disability or disease, demonized by epilepsy or mental illness. People needed to be set free from their hopelessness. And in Jesus, God was with them, promising freedom, promising healing. Are you aware of ways that God is with you, bringing good, you good news of new life?
In what ways would you like Jesus to set you free? What are the intolerable or deadening things in your life that you wish God would free you from? Pray about these things every day until God's Spirit shows you the way to new life. In the synagogue in Nazareth, the meaning of God's word was revealed in a new way in the person of Jesus, its living incarnation. Luke has told us how Jesus wrestled with the devil in the wilderness. He resisted the temptations to use his talents for personal gain or earthly glory. It was plain to him that God wanted him to follow a quite different path from the way of the world. Luke takes Jesus straight from that wilderness encounter to the Nazareth synagogue to begin a radical new ministry of bringing good news to the poor, freeing the captives, bringing sight to the blind, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. And what of us? We long for freedom, or healing, or a new lease of life. And Christ came into the world like light in darkness to bring us these things. And we are called to live in imitation of Jesus in every way. So what might it mean for you to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the oppressed? and recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. To whom can you bring the good news of God's love right now, or in the time that lies ahead? Luke was a doctor who specialised in physical remedies for the body. He was called by God to extend his profession, to move from physical to spiritual medicine, to tell stories of power to mend lives and revive faint hearts. This is our calling too, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, and we too are anointed to bring good news to the suffering world that God longs to make whole. Amen. Everlasting God, we thank you for welcoming us in love. 
Hear us as we pray for the good of the church, the world, and for all in need. Faithful God, as our gospel shows us, Christ preaching in the temple, we pray for Reverend Sheila and all who preach your word week by week in Holy Trinity Dunfermline and in the worldwide church. Inspire them all in their ministry as they lead us and help us to grow as disciples. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Creator God of every land and nation, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus Christ. We pray for our troubled world, for its peoples and their leaders. We pray for those caught up in war and violence, especially the innocent victims of evil and destructive acts of terrorism. We pray especially at this time that conflict in Ukraine can be avoided and that humanitarian aid can be delivered where it is most needed in Afghanistan. May peace be found and good sense flourish that we may see injustice and wrong vanquished. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Abundant God, be with those of us that desire and need your restoration and healing. As we remember the way your Son, Jesus Christ, healed the lame, restored sight to the blind, and cast out demons, we remember today all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, especially when it comes from the fear of the ongoing pandemic. Today we ask for your blessing and healing touch upon them. In a moment of silence, we bring to you those who are known to us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful God, your love reaches beyond the grave. At the end of our days on earth, be with us and with those we love. May those who have gone before us rest in your eternal peace. We remember before you those who have died recently, and we pray for all whose life is saddened by the death of a loved one. Be with them in their loneliness, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Faithful God, we pray for ourselves. As we go from your house today to start the week ahead, we ask that in all we do, we may walk more closely with you at our side, safe in knowledge that your fatherly love and care knows no bounds. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us present our offerings to the Lord. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you and from your own. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Worship and praise belong to you, Father, in every place and at all times. All power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ, your Son, our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us by new birth in a creation restored by love. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. 
May we who have eaten at this holy table be strengthened for service in your world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Christ, the Son of God, gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.